Welcome to the War from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. As many movies and radio programs that were made during the war about the war, uh, the trend of war books and war movies and war television shows and war miniseries has pretty much uh, continued since the war. There have been some times when there have been breaks, but we continue to have a fascination with this period of history, leading to uh, new movies. It's helped by the fact that the story of the war isn't one story, except in this big high-level way. It's thousands of little stories, each of which can be made quite compelling in the hands of the right creative team. One of the first of these post-war war war movies was The House on 92nd Street. It opened in September of 1945 and won an Oscar for Best Writing. It told a tale of early war, a story that couldn't have been told till after the war, in which the FBI dealt with an attempt by the Nazis to steal atomic secrets from the United States. So here's the Screen Guild theater adaptation of The House on 92nd Street from June 10th of 1946. Esther presents the Screen Guild Players. The Lady Esther Screen Guild play tonight, The House on 92nd Street. The starring players, this is Lloyd Nolan, and this is Bill Lundigan. Tonight, Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in the house on 92nd Street, 20th Century Fox's sensational motion picture scoop based on the actual FBI record of how the secret of the atom bomb was protected. It stars Lloyd Nolan as Inspector Briggs, William Lundigan as Bill Dietrich, with Lucille Meredith as Elsa Gerhardt. The Lady Esther Screen Guild players in the house on 92nd Street. crowded secret files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, no record is more amazing or spectacular than the case of Process 97. Now, at last, the story can be told. And here is the only man who can tell it, Inspector George A. Briggs of the FBI. The case of Process 97 began for us in the FBI on the 13th of May, 1941. And strangely enough, it began with an accident. Look out! An accident and one other thing. A pair of pointed patent leather shoes. May 13th, 1941. That afternoon, while crossing a busy New York street, a man had been hit by a taxi cab. He was badly injured. And afterwards, in the ambulance, with the intern and the traffic policeman. What do you think, Doc? You got a chance? Not much. Maybe uh, wait a minute. I'm trying to talk. Listen. Grace the third. Grace the third. Hey, Joe, slow down. He's through. Wonder who he was. Might be some identification on him. Here, yeah, here's something. Spanish passport. Francisco Alvarez. Notebook, too. Say, Doc, this uh-huh. stuff is all in German. Well, let's see. Huh. Stuff about ships, I think. And Frankengeschaft. That means incendiary bullet. It does? Hey, what kind of stuff is that for a guy to be carrying around with a war on? Yeah. Does seem something funny about it. I'll say. I'm going to turn this stuff over to the FBI. 
One look and I knew the stuff was hot. I didn't know how hot until later. And while my laboratory men were going over the notebook and the other fake papers taken off the dead man, I had the driver of the cab brought in. You see, Inspector, there was two of them. And they was talking and not looking. I slammed on the brake. What and... happened to the other man? He jumped out of the way. And then the next thing I knew, I was out in the street holding this fellow's head and screaming for an ambulance. And then the other guy picked up his briefcase. Oh, he was carrying a brief briefcase, huh? Yes, sir. And I remember seeing his pal pick it up. But later, when I looked around for him, he was gone. Could you give me a description? No, sir. Except maybe one little thing. What? Well, I was holding this fellow, like I said. And the other guy was standing there for a second. And I noticed one thing. Yes? He was wearing some pointy, patent leather shoes. <laughs> Uh, stuff's come through the lab, Mr. Briggs. You get anything? The Spanish letter had a German message written in between the lines. Invisible ink and code. Cryptanalysis seen it? Yes, sir. They've broken it. It says, Herr Christoph, wird seek auf Prozess 97, concentrieren. That translates, Mr. Christopher will concentrate on Process 97. Repeat that. Herr Christoph, um, Mr. Christopher, will concentrate on Process 97. Thanks. That's all. Yes, sir. Hello. Hello, Briggs speaking. Set up a conference with Army and Navy intelligence at once. Mr. Christopher will concentrate on... Well, this is impossible, Mr. Briggs. No one knows that Process 97 even exists. Well, I'm afraid the Germans know. How much they know is something that we'll have to find out. Well, you've got to work fast. I understand, General. I'm not sure that you do, Mr. Briggs. Perhaps I should tell you. Process 97 is not just another weapon, not just a new explosive. Its properties, the scientific principles involved, may someday revolutionize life on this planet. Its military application is so devastating that I hope we will never be forced to use it. But until the process is perfected, it must be kept an absolute secret. And for that, we look to the FBI. We'll do our best, sir. Have you any other information? Not at this time. There must be some lead. Who is this Mr. Christopher? Hmm. I wish I knew. I was in a blind alley and I knew it. But as it happened, at almost that very moment in Hamburg, Germany... You will sail for New York tomorrow, Herr Dietrich, by way of Lisbon. I'm ready here, Strassen. I have your papers here. Draft card, driver's license, army discharge, social security. No one could tell them from original. <laughs> They're pretty neat. These are your credentials. And here are the messages. Microfilm. They will fit into the back of your watch. Okay. Your mission is vital. When you reach New York, you will go immediately to a Miss Elsa Gearhoff. Through her, you will contact Colonel Hammerson and Adolf Klein. These are the only contacts you will make, Herr Dietrich. I see. Now, one thing more. There is one person in the United States who can understand, uh, under, can countermand the orders I have given you. If you ever receive instructions from Mr. Christopher, abandon everything else and place yourself entirely at his disposal. I understand. Where will I find this, uh, this Elsa Gerhardt? She runs a fashionable dress shop in New York. I have the address here. In a house on 92nd Street. That was all very neat, except for one thing. Bill Dietrich happened to be one of our men. An American born to German parents, the Nazis had made him a tempting offer. And apparently, he'd agreed to work for them. But before he'd even sailed from Lisbon, his watch with the precious microfilm was exchanged for a duplicate and on its way to us by a clipper. And 27 hours later, in our laboratory... You want this microfilm altered, Mr. Briggs? Yes, just the last line. You see, where it says he is forbidden to contact any other agents? Uh, yes, sir. How do you want it to read? Authorize to contact all other agents. <laughs> smuggled Bill's watch back to him myself. And he was coming through the customs. And as he left the pier, he was followed by a pair of pointed patent leather shoes. Elsa, you are sure these his credentials? Microfilm, like all the others, Mac. Uh, I don't like it. All the rest of us are forbidden to contact other agents. Why should he have so much authority? Why not ask him? I'll call him in. All right, Mr. Dietrich. Hello. This is Max Koberg. Used to be with the Eiferny Vakpoon. Max has special duties. Mm, Gestapo, I know about him. What do you know? 
The usual thing. Yeah? Well, what do we know about you? You've seen my credentials. Perhaps you'd like to tell us more. Where did you come from? Germany. Where in Germany? Hamburg, 26 Lindenstrasse. Who sent you? Colonel Felix Strassen. When did you leave? Three weeks ago. When did you arrive? Look, why do I have to answer all these questions? I showed you my credentials. Maybe you don't want to tell us when you got here. Well, Mr. Dietrich? Oh, it, 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 it isn't that. It's just that... All right, we'll tell you. You left the pier at 10.50 this morning. You took a cab to the Martinique Hotel, 30th and Broad, checked in and stayed there until 12.30. You took a bus to Times Square, went into the Silver Dollar, 46th Street, and had a cup of coffee. You left at 1.17 and went into the newsreel. You spent an hour in the theater... Then you took a cab to 92nd and 5th, got out, and walked the rest of the way over here. <laughs> well, it looks like you know all about me. Yeah, and we're going to keep on knowing. What's so special about you, Dietrich? Special? Why should you be authorized to know all our agents? Hamburg wants information direct and quickly. I'm to build a shortwave radio set. You'll help me get the parts, of course, and all information will clear me. Those are orders. You're to put me in touch with Hammerstone and Adolf Klein. I've got money for them. I'll open an engineering office. They can contact me there. Now, if you'll give me back my credentials. Of course. Thanks. I'll let you know when I've got my office. I'll see you soon, I hope. Elsa, I don't like it. He knows too much, and I don't care about his credentials. I... I'm going to check them, Max. I'm going to ask Hamburg for confirmation. How? By mail through Argentina. That will take a little time, of course. But I'm willing to wait and be sure. That was the summer of 1941. Bill set up his office right away, a blind for the Nazis. A better blind for us. Through a secret opening in the wall, we took motion pictures of everyone who came in. Made recordings of everything they said. In the meantime, Bill got his short wave set going in a lonely section of New Jersey, and that seemed to satisfy Elsa and Max. But there was one little thing they didn't know. I've substituted parts for the ones they bought me. The way the set is built now, I can only send about 100 miles. Well, that's enough to reach our long-range station. We'll pick up whatever messages you send, take out what we think is dangerous, and send the rest on through to Hamburg. Then we'll pick up their answers and relay the unimportant stuff to you. <laughs> what are you grinning at, Bill? <laughs> you know... It's quite a gag. Yes, quite a gag. And it worked. That's how we operated for months, getting our information straight from Berlin. And all the time, Bill was widening his contacts. New people coming to his office constantly to be photographed and recorded. We were building up quite a special file, but still no hint about Process 97. Still no clue to Mr. Christopher. And then all of a sudden, things began to happen. Starting with Sunday, December 7th. Extra, extra, Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. Extra, extra, Hitler declares war. The FBI was prepared. We were ready to act. Your name, Hans Mueller? Yes. You're under arrest. Carl Schlosser? Yes. You're wanted by the FBI. Charles Ludwig Poggle? Yes. The FBI wants to talk to you. Come along. I didn't have Elsa and her house brought in. I was still hoping for some kind of break. And as it happens, it came that night. Elsa, I found your message at the hotel. You wanted to see me? Why did you take so long? Where have you been? Over at the radio shack. What's up? I have an envelope here with some papers in it. You must get it to Hamburg just as fast as you can make the transmission. What is it? The most important job we have ever undertaken. If we hadn't done anything else in all the years we've been working here... The information in this envelope would be more than worth it. Now, Dietrich, it's up to you. I'll get it through. Cigarette? I don't smoke. Oh, my mistake. Let's have a look at those papers. You're to have them back here tomorrow night. Oh, that's a tough order. I've got to put them all in code. That takes time. Orders aren't to be questioned. Why can't I just burn them after I've finished? Radio transmissions are often garbled. This data will also be sent by mail. The order comes from Mr. Christopher. Christopher? The envelope was delivered less than 30 minutes ago. I can't impress on you how urgent it is. You, you don't have to, Elsa. I think I can guess. Bill, you're sure she mentioned Christopher? I'm positive. Could you tell anything from the stuff in the envelope? Well, they look like scientific formulas. 
They could be related to process 97. I'll know better when Dr. Appleton gets here. He's flying up from Washington. Oh, don't forget to return those papers by tomorrow. No, I won't. You know, it's the first lead I've had on Mr. Christopher. He's been so completely non-existent, I, I can't believe he delivered those papers himself. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty positive he didn't. What makes you so sure? Well, whoever did deliver those papers was in that room right before I got there. All right, all right, then take a look at this. Cigarette butt with lipstick on it. I snitched it out of Elsa's ashtray. Well, wouldn't you expect it to have lipstick on it? No, you wouldn't. That's my point. You see, Elsa Gerhardt does not smoke. The second act of the Lady Esther Screen Guild play will follow in just a moment. Now... A word from Lady Esther. You've often heard it's a lot more fun to give than to receive. Well, I can only tell you I've been most happy since I began offering my special beauty dividend, celebrating my 30th anniversary. In case you've missed my previous announcements, this beauty dividend is my anniversary gift to you because 1946 marks Lady Esther's 30th year helping women look younger and more attractive. And my exciting Lady Esther anniversary set is ready now at your favorite store. It gives you a dollar ninety-three value of Lady Esther face powder and Lady Esther face cream for only ninety-eight cents. Call it a gift to you, a bonus, a dividend. Call it what you like, but in simple words, you save ninety-five cents. You see, my anniversary set contains the large dollar thirty-eight jar of Lady Esther Four Purpose face cream. It also contains the large 55-cent box of Lady Esther face powder in my fascinating, romantic new shade, Bridal Pink. That's a total value of $1.93. But in my anniversary set, you get both, conveniently packed to take along on summer vacations, for only 98 cents. It's a real value. Actually, double value for your money. It's your chance, if you don't already know, to learn how much real help you get from Lady Esther Face Powder and Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream. Real help in looking prettier and younger. Go to your favorite store tomorrow and get your Lady Esther Anniversary Set. Lady Esther presents the second act of The House on 92nd Street, starring William Lundigan as Bill Dietrich, Lucille Meredith as Elsa Gerhardt, and Lloyd Nolan in his original role as Inspector Briggs. The Inspector continues our story. just brought to me, a cigarette butt with a lipstick on it, and still in the back of my mind, that pair of pointed patent leather shoes. Dr. Appleton arrived from Washington within the hour. For a long time, he studied the papers I handed him, and when he looked up, his face was white with shock. Mr. Briggs, there's no doubt about it. These papers contain data on process 97. Are they accurate? Appallingly. These are details of experiments we made barely two days ago. We had to work pretty fast. Dr. Appleton stayed with us most of that night, changing some of the figures, just enough to throw the Germans off the track. Then we retyped the whole thing with the same kind of machine that had been used originally. And Bill transmitted it and took the envelope back to Elsa. Dr. Appleton was completely upset. I don't understand it, Briggs. Most of the workers and technicians never leave the central laboratory area. We have our own laundry, movies, library, even a drugstore and a soda fountain. But some workers do leave. A few, but they undergo the most meticulous examination through a fluoroscope. I even have to go through it myself, and these clothes I'm wearing were handed to me by an armed guard. And still this data has got out. Mr. Briggs, do you have any hope of finding the man who's behind all this? We'll find him. Hello. Hello, Briggs talking. I want motion pictures made of every person who leaves the central laboratory of Process 97. Yes, that's right. But be sure they don't know that they're being photographed. We got those pictures through an X-ray mirror on the side of a truck parked opposite the entrance. 
And while that was being done, we went to work on the cigarette butt, or to be exact, on the lipstick. Our tests showed it to be a certain brand made up specially for 98 different beauty parlors in New York. All employees and clients of these beauty parlors were checked until that search narrowed down to one particular woman, a woman known to be a German agent. No question about it, Mr. Briggs. Louise Varger left that cigarette butt in Elsa Gerhardt's ashtray. You've kept a watch on her? Yes, sir. We've been taking motion pictures of everybody who came to see her. Y- yes. We've uh, checked them against the pictures we got over at Process 97. One of those workers is a friend of Louise Varger. Who? Name's Roper. We have a picture of him going into her house. You get anything else? Yes, sir. We made a search while she was out. The typewriter check. Hmm. It's the one on which those formulas were written. Well, that much adds up. The girl delivered the data Elsa. She got it from Roper, and Roper smuggled it out to her. We still don't know how. We've got to find out how. We won't We won't bring him in until we do. You know, it's funny. We didn't figure out the answer. We got it from Germany. A message came through for, from Bill. It said, On orders from Mr. Christopher, Max Koberg will remove Gedeckness Kunstler. The Christopher part of it was enough to catch my attention. But it was Bill Dietrich who explained the rest. Gedeckness Kunstler. You know, that's a familiar word in Hamburg for a very special type of agent. Yes? Mm Uh-huh. It means memory artist. Memory artist? Uh Uh-huh. Hamburg was always looking for them. They took a special course to improve their memories even further. Well, you think it's possible for a man to to get those formulas out by memory? Complicated stuff like that? Seems incredible, but that's what they're trained to do. Well, it could be at that. Memory artist. Photographic mind. A little bit at a time, Come on, Bill, let's take a walk. Where? Broadway. We're going to see some vaudeville agents. Yeah, I used to book that Aston. Fellow named Roper. That's his picture you got there. Descriptions on the back. Vaudeville banquet special parties. Demonstrates amazing feats of memory. That don't mean nothing. They always write their own billing. What uh, what kind of feats? What what was the angle? Uh, People that call out things from the audience. They had stuff from highbrow books. Sometimes he kept 14 games of chess going at the same time. Lousy game, chess. Yes, but 14 games at the same time, that would mean uh, remarkable memory. What's the difference? It ain't box office. I'll uh, take this picture along. You'll get it back. Don't bother, mister. The act is out of date. We were ready to move now. We brought the girl in and picked up Roper, too. It wasn't any job to break them down. We had too much evidence. But the one thing I wanted, I still didn't get. I tell you, I don't know, Mr. Christopher. I've never seen him. All right, Roper. Then how did you deliver the formulas? I left them at Lang's Bookshop on 59th Street. I put them in a book called Spencer's First Principles. Those were my instructions. When did you make your last delivery? This morning on on my way to work. And what was it you delivered? The the latest data of our final experiments. Come along, Roper. You're under arrest. (laughs) That meant more secret motion picture work on Lang's bookshop. Every person who came in or out. And finally, we had a clue. I think we've got something, Mr. Briggs. We got a shot of this man coming out of Lang's bookshop, and we got the same man on another reel. Which one? Some stuff we shot last week. He was going into the house on 92nd Street. Did you question Lang? Yes, sir. He admits it's a fellow who picked up the formulas, but he swears he doesn't know who he is. Uh, shall we bring in Elsa Gerhardt now? No. No, uh, let's bring in Mr. Christopher. Max! Max! What's the matter, Elsa? The courier just brought a letter by way of Argentina and Italy. The confirmation on those credentials. Look, see what it says. He is forbidden to contact any other agents. Elsa, it says forbidden. Yes, quite different from the credentials he showed us. Where is he now, Elsa? At the radio shack. Go out and get him, Max. I want to talk to him. Hello? Hello, that's you, Mr. Briggs? Uh, yes, sir, this is Julius. Yes, sir, fella, just come and took him away. Uh, no, sir, nobody didn't pay no attention to me. Uh, I was fixing the fence near the radio shack. Uh, yes, sir, I got a feeling you better hurry. <laughs> you better talk, Dietrich. Come on, talk. Oh, okay. I can keep this up for hours. Oh, that won't do any good, Max. He'll start talking when that injection starts to work. What was it you gave him? Scopolamine. It drugs part of the brain. Oh. 
may be working oh. now. Let me have a throw. Wake up, you. Wake up and talk. Oh, not a chance. All right. We can wait. I'll take it, Max. Yes? I'd like to talk to Bill Diedrich. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. He isn't here. Listen, we've taken over the ground floor. The house is surrounded. Surrounded? The FBI. We'll give you exactly two minutes. Women come out first. The men will follow hands above them. Max, turn off the lights. What's the matter? What's up, you fool? It's the FBI. It didn't take too long. Things happened pretty fast after that. Well, Bill was in the room. Perhaps he can tell you better than I can. How about it, Bill? Well, I don't know. I was sort of fuzzy right then. But it seemed to me Elsa turned to Max and spouted a lot of orders at him and then slammed through the door to the other room. Max started piling papers into the fireplace. You know, the old Dodge burning the evidence. But just then a gas bomb came through the window. That gave me the chance I was waiting for, and I tackled Max. For a while, we were all over the place, and the gas was pretty thick. We were coughing and choking. By that time, you were crashing in the door, and I thought if I could just hold on... But I couldn't. I was too weak. He shook me off and reached for his gun. I thought I was a goner for sure, but just then the door of the other room opened. It was awful smoking in there, but we could see a man. Max didn't stop to ask any questions. He started to shoot. Twice. And then again. And again. Whoever it was came stumbling into the room and fell right in front of us. And then all of a sudden, Max just dropped his gun and picked the man up and held him in his arms. And he just kept on saying over and over, Elsa. Elsa. I guess that was just about all, Mr. Briggs. Next second, you and your men were in the room, and Max was going out with his hands above his head. You were looking down at Elsa and telling the others, Well, I guess Process 97 is safe for a while. Where's your Mr. Christopher? Christopher? <laughs> that's that's Elsa Gerhardt, isn't it? Sure. She must have made a quick change. You'll find her clothes in the other room, Bill. Yes, uh, you said this was Christopher. Well, don't you see what I see? All right. Look. A pair of pointed patent leather shoes. Thank you, Lloyd Nolan and William Lundigan for your fine performance in tonight's play. The Lady Esther Screen Guild players are grateful indeed for your appearance here because, as you know, the benefits from these programs go to support the fine work of the Motion Picture Relief Fund and its country house. And now, before we tell you about next week's play, here's a word from one of America's best-known beauty authorities, Lady Esther. Thousands of women all over the country have already sent me best wishes on my 30th anniversary. Lady Esther's 30th year helping women look more attractive. Many have told me how much they appreciate and value my birthday beauty dividend offered to them and to you, celebrating the anniversary year. This beauty dividend is my special Lady Esther set, waiting for you now at your favorite store. It contains a large $1.38 jar of Lady Esther face cream and a large 55-cent box of Lady Esther face powder. That's a total value of $1.93. But in my anniversary set, you get both the $1.38 jar of cream and the 55-cent box of powder for only 98 cents. You save 95 cents, and that saving practically one-half is my anniversary gift to you. Remember, it's Lady Esther's famous four-purpose face cream and it's Lady Esther's specially blended face powder in my romantic, glamorous new shade, Bridal Pink. You get a generous supply of both these basic aids that are all you need to keep your skin looking younger and more attractive. I know some of you, even now, have never tried these two most essential aids for smoother, softer, younger-looking skin. For you, this is a special opportunity. So be sure to get your Lady Esther anniversary set tomorrow at your favorite store. You'll save 95 cents, and you'll benefit all summer long. Next week, 
the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will present Marriage is a Private Affair. It will star John Hodiak and Lana Turner. Be sure to listen. The House on 92nd Street was presented through the courtesy of 20th Street Fox, producers of Do You Love Me? Lloyd Nolan is currently appearing in the 20th Century Fox production, Somewhere in the Night. William Lundigan is currently working in the Hunt Stromberg production, Dishonored Lady. Music on tonight's program was arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. This is Truman Bradley speaking for Lady Esther. Thank you, and good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. A great story, and uh, Lloyd uh, Nolan would actually uh, reprise the uh, uh, character of uh, Agent Briggs in The Street With No Name. That will actually be all for today. We will be back tomorrow as we've looked at history as it's happened. We'll take a look as history as it might have been. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. This uh, program is a service of the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio, greatdetectives.net. Ken Curlin provides the opening theme music, kencurlin.com. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.